So actually, actually, your question has everything to do with the topic that I picked for this week's <laughs> class. And it's, and it's about the Kabbalistic way of handling challenges in our life. We all have daily challenges. Who was in challenge today? Who was in challenge today? Who doesn't have uh, issues every day with people, friends, family, society? We all have challenges today. And the funny thing is that these challenges are different. What do I call challenge for someone else may not be a challenge at all. So why do we face challenges? Why God create the challenges? What brings these challenges to us? And why do we have repetitive challenges? Let's say you don't like cats, right? You don't like cats, and no matter how much you want to stay away from cats, cats keep coming up at your door. Funny example because you're here, Julia. She loves cat. She has a beautiful cat. So when challenges do come to us, and especially when these challenges become repetitive, it repeats itself over and over again, and we hate it, it's difficult, what is the purpose? Why God created challenges in our life? And why everybody's challenge is different? Um, does anybody want to give me an example of challenges that you went through today? Are, are you guys comfortable with that? So we can dissect it, we can work on it, like a workshop. Juna. I don't have a man. My daughter is getting her master's degree, right? Your daughter is? Is getting her master's degree. Beautiful. And she's already teaching. Yes. And her salary was this much. Yes. And today they are giving her an offer, since she's having a master's degree, and her salary is going up a notch, I mean like a couple of hundred dollars more per month. Okay. So I was telling her that, is that right? I mean, you went through these two years of grueling and this much expenses for the university and this and that for a couple of hundred dollars more a month. It doesn't make sense to me. I want you to go and do your research or go if they say that this is what it is, maybe you want to go apply to another couple of schools, get to see that what is their offer, maybe you want to put it in front of them and see that they, if you want to, you know, uh, match it. So I was fighting for her to say that, you know, get what is belong to you, you know, rightfully. And she tells me that, are you calling me stupid? Are you telling me that you don't know what I'm doing? <laughs> are you going crazy on me? I, I mean, this comes at me like this and I'm like that. I didn't mean it that way. I love it. I just said that it doesn't make sense logically that okay, after two years, around that forty thousand dollars in expenses, the thesis that you did, your new offer would be a couple of hundred dollars more a month. Right. It just doesn't make sense to me. Right. And I get back all these things from her. Right. And I'm just like, wow. So that was my challenge today. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Beautiful challenge. Juna. I like to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait for the answer. Let's masses, wait for yeah. the answer. Let's hear a few challenges and then we'll when then we can really see the big picture. Anybody else wants to share? Please be comfortable. Mr. Man, I'm so comfortable I tell you everything about my neighbors. Let's talk. Anybody else? I found that someone very close to me has been talking a lot of bad things about me behind my back. Uh huh. And how did you feel? I was very upset. Very upset. Good. Okay. Good example. Yeah, I said, I said to myself, I said, that's good. Give me more. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was saying, that's why I came to press. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what else? I have challenge every day and night. <laughs> <laughs> Baruch Hashem. 
You want to give us an share an example with us? Yeah, because my neighbor next to my house is an Iranian from Shiraz. End of challenge. And he's Jewish, and he put that house in a super house, and 20 people live there, and they bothering me all the time with the parking. I have a fight with them every day. <laughs> and your fight is because of parking. because they park in front of my house and they park all the places and there is no parking. Very good. Good. That's a good challenge too. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> Anybody else? We all receive challenges according to what our Tikkun is, our correction is. Does it make sense? The challenge that you receive, it's designed for you, it's produced for you by the universe according to your Tikkun, according to your, the things you need to correct. So it's designed for you. The fact that your daughter didn't receive the offer that you think she deserves <laughs> is just the cosmos creating a scenario that you would have that dialogue with your daughter. The reason that person talked behind you because the cosmos wanted to touch where you are vulnerable so you could do something about it. Your beautiful Shirazi neighbor <laughs> <laughs> that is taking advantage of his house and not being considerate for the neighbors, which you are. And I'm not saying these are just. And I'm not, I don't want to justify it. We're not supposed to justify it. I don't mind, but I, I no, no, don't good, want good, them good. to park you. Properly. No so they're, they're doing something that is touching your emotion, yeah. your nerve. So let me go back. Everything that happens for you, it's designed for you according to your tikkun. Why your neighbor is not Shirazi and is not parking car? Because that's not your tikkun. He doesn't live there. <laughs> <laughs> he just rented to the super house. <laughs> He's the one making money. I'm the one suffering. <laughs> Here we go. Exactly. <laughs> so, first, I want to establish this principle that everything that is happening to you, for you, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that she does the person bought a house. <laughs> now we know, Shalom. Welcome. Actually, Karasov is with my house, the Shira did too, <laughs> from Iraq. So the reason that this person <laughs> bought the house, one of the reasons, is because what she went through with the with the cause of him having that house. So what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> before we came to this world, when we were just a soul without the body, we needed to fix something. We needed to correct something. We did things in our previous life that needed, we needed another opportunity to come to this world and to fix it. That's why we ask God, please send us back. Please give us another opportunity. So he gives, he is merciful, he's lovely, he says, okay, I'll give you another chance. So, and then he creates these realities, these illusionary realities for us to work on what is my correction, what is my tikkun. 
the fact that you are emotional, I am emotional, the fact <coughs> that things happen and we're not comfortable, it's only an indication, it's only an indication <coughs> that the cosmos is creating a situation for me to work on what I need to fix my tikkun. Now, tonight we are here to learn how to deal with these challenges. <laughs> because these challenges, because we have free will, and we are supposed to have free will, God is not going to tell you, you know what, this Shirazi neighbor is buying this house because of what happened last time, month ago, 10 years ago, your previous life. No, he's going to conceal it. So you have an opportunity to fix that. Because if he tells you everything, if he tells you the reason you love cats is because of this, then there is no earning. There is, you cannot fix it. So he conceals the reason behind it. He conceals the light behind it for us to reveal it, to find out, fix it, and see the light behind it, and correct our tikkun. Correct what it needs to be corrected in me. Now, before I go on, two things could happen. Two things could happen. I could be a reactive, not understanding Kabbalah, and totally being a victim of conscience, and suffer, suffer the hurt, suffer the agreement, suffer the neighbor, go through the pain, and one way is to be cleansed because of the pain we go through. We go through pains for two reasons. Pain is always an indication of that we need to create light. I need to fix something. Pain is an indication, is an awakening. You need to change something. You need to correct something. There is a cleansing part happening to you. Now, I could either cherish it, because Baruch Hashem, this is good. I love it that she talked be negative behind me. I love it that this guy bought this house and created a headache for me. I love it. Just like when I went to my neighbors and I said, you're an angel in my life. I cherished it. I cherished the challenge. I said. God is sending this for me. Cosmos is creating this for me. So this must be good. Yes, I don't understand it because I live in this physical illusionary world. I have five cents. I don't see tomorrow. I don't see the next year. But I know it's good for me. I know it's good for me. So the moment I... And how do I reach to that point? When the challenge happens, when the challenge happens, we are supposed to... Pause. We're not supposed to react immediately. Every time we become emotional, learn this. Take this home with you today. Every time you become emotional because of the challenge that happened to you, you've lost the challenge. You've lost the opportunity. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. okay. If you become emotional, if you create a drama, if you create a drama, if you want to go confront because now this is dramatic, he shouldn't have said that, they shouldn't have done that, I am upset, this is not fair. Why this is happening to me? I raise my voice, I become angry, I become sad. Then I have lost the opportunity to fix what I need needed to fix. Then he's going to give you another opportunity. He's going to create another opportunity. Another one, another one, another one. Until you finally say, well, thank you. All right, I get it. And you pause and you step back and you look at it. And instead of saying, why this is happening to me? You say, wait a minute. What God is telling me? What God is creating? Why this is happening? for me. Why is this happening for me? The moment I pause and I wait and I don't react, now I'm in control of that situation. 
as long as you are still in the emotional mood, you're sensitive about it, you're losing an opportunity. I'm sure most of you guys saw these Game of Thrones, the, the, the episodes of Game of Thrones, right? I think the most genius, everybody has seen it? No. no. Really? No? Not even one. Not even a commercial. Wow. <laughs> the person who comes at the end of this <coughs> ninth season, eighth season, whatever, of this amazing production, and stories within the stories and within the stories, the person who comes out smelling like roses is the one who doesn't react to anything. Person becomes the king is about Trump is about being the kings of the kings of the kings of this amazing kingdom. Everybody who's after that chair, after that throne, gets killed, gets smashed, gets destroyed. Everybody who's so emotional about achieving, emotional about achieving what they want to achieve, they lose. The only person who doesn't care about the chair, who doesn't ask about the chair, who doesn't become emotional about the chair, at the end of the eighth episode, he becomes the king. So again, this is so easy. I know it's difficult to practice it in a daily life. But understand that every time a challenge comes, and it's supposed to move your emotion, you're supposed to get hurt. You're supposed to fall. You're supposed to feel bad. It has to. We are human. We have feelings. So we do get hurt. We do get frustrated. We do get disappointed. But how long this feeling of disappointment, resent, sadness should take over me? Not too long. Because if it stays with me, and now I am revengeful. Now I want to confront. Now I want to fix the situation. Now I want to fix that person. I want to tell him what he did. I want to tell the world what he did. I want to fix it now. I'm mad. I want to go confront now. Something bad happened to, bad happened to me. I want to fix it right away. Being emotional, you've lost the opportunity of what God has created for you. As long as you're emo you are emotional towards anything, any challenge that happens to you, you've lost the opportunity of creating light out of that challenge. <coughs> Is everybody with me? Yep. Does it make sense? Yes. Because when you are, when you become emotional, who is becoming emotional in you? Is it your soul or is it your body? Body. Your body. Do you think your soul is emotional? No. Not at all. The soul wants the opportunity 24 7, wants the challenge. Because your soul knows that I need, I need this argument with my daughter because there is a tikkun between me and my daughter. I need that person to talk Lashon Hara behind me because there is a tikkun between me and that person who said Lashon Hara behind me. There is a tikkun. That's why it's happening. That's why I'm emotional. And as long as I'm emotional, as long as I don't pause, I don't stand back, and I analyze it from myself, and come to the sense that this is really good for me. This is an opportunity for me to fix what I need to fix in myself. Where is the light for me? What God wants to tell me? Where is it? Where am I vulnerable? What am I reacting to? Where is my tikkun here? What is my tikkun here? My tikkun. My tikkun. Things happen, ladies and gentlemen. Things happen, and you know it, and you feel it. We all went through some challenges today. 
Not everything went according to your watch. It never does go everything according to your watch. It never does. It never goes according to what you plan. Every day that you get up, you don't know what news are you going to hear. You don't know what people are going to say to you. You have no control over anything in this world. In reality, we have no control of whatever happens in this world. We have zero control. If you think you have control, then you are wrong. The only thing that you have control is over your reactive reactivity. That's all. The only free will that we have, the only free will that we have is either to control my emotion or to let go of my emotion. The moment you pause, you wait, you don't judge that moment. You don't judge that person. You don't judge that challenge. You sit back and you look at it. And you appreciate. You appreciate what is happening to you. You know what capitalists suggest? When you face a challenge, the first thing before even you pause, laugh at it. Laugh at it. You give a beautiful idea to your daughter and she attacks you, laugh at it. <laughs> laugh at it. What happens when you laugh at it? Now you're not controlled by your emotion anymore. You're totally in control on your emotion. Now your emotion will come to your assistant versus to come to destroy you to destroy the moment, that moment that you can change things in your life. Because we know, God forbid, people who say Lashon Hara behind you, what you receive, you receive blessing. You receive blessing. When people talk negative about you, you don't receive, you don't receive negativity. You receive blessing. If someone behind me says, no, there is thief, I receive sustenance. I will receive good things as long as I perceive it as a good thing. It's only me that with my perception of what happened, I can create misery or sadness or depression or victim consciousness for myself. Because when we say things, this cosmos return everything that we do, we say, we act, it comes back to us. It comes back to us. If I say I love you, love comes back to me. If I say I hate you, God forbid, hate comes back to me. If I think positive about someone, the positivity will come back to me. So whoever, whatever they say behind you, it's for them, it's not for you. But how do I perceive it? How do I perceive it? Why such a thing sets such a Lashon Hara behind me? Why is it for me? Then I need to learn something. Maybe I am, I don't like to be criticized. Just for the sake of example. Maybe I don't like to be criticized. Maybe I care too much about what people think of me. Maybe I care so much about my image in the society. Then, this is my tikkun now. My tikkun, maybe my tikkun is that I am so afraid what people think of me. That when someone talks to Shurim Harai, but if someone says, no, there is a thief, and I'm so worried, oh my God, they said, no, there is a thief. Now everybody thinks, no, there is a thief. That shows that I have tikkun about what people think of me. I'm not sure of myself. That's the tikkun. So every challenge, every challenge comes to you because of your tikkun. No other reason. And as long, as long as I see the goodness in the, in the challenges, as long as I inject this certainty that there is a light in this challenge, God wants to give me something. God wants me to see something. God wants me to fix something. And I have to diagnose 
what that challenge is, what is it hurting, right? Just like a doctor who diagnosed a problem, instead of reacting to it, being emotional about it, look for the diagnosis. What is it that I need to change? With that perception, then you can solve everything. Maybe for, I'm going to use your example because it was a good example. People could be annoying. I get it. People could park in instead of my parking space. Why someone park in my parking space? Let's say you have an appointment and there's a parking spot for you. And you come to park and there's no other parking and the parking that it was assigned for you is occupied by someone else. Now, if you haven't come to this class, if you have learned not to be emotional and not to understand the opportunity, you might be very frustrated. You might do something crazy with the car who parked in your space. Or you may <laughs> run around and frustrated and got to be running into an accident. Or you could say, why this is happening for me? Let me see. Maybe I shouldn't go to this meeting. Maybe this is happening because I don't have patience for people. Maybe, maybe there is something for me to see. To trust, to trust the system. To have certainty about the system. The system that, had, that God has created. There is no such thing as an accident in his system. There is no flaws in his system. The, his system is a perfect, perfect system. Perfect system. Designed to details for us. For every one of us. Designed exactly according to what I need. That's why our challenges are different. It's designed for you. Today, he gives it to you, he brings it to you, he creates it for you. And when I trust it, if it's a pain I have to go through, it could be a form of cleansing. Form of cleansing. Maybe you broke somebody's, body's heart, somebody's heart before. Maybe you cheated someone else before. Maybe you said Lashonara right against someone else before. And the cosmos wants to cleanse that for you. There is a payment to be made. <clears throat> and when you trust it, you make the payment without the suffering. Pain is good. Suffering is not good. Suffering is our perception. Suffering is what we choose to suffer. You don't have to suffer. Go through the pain. Cherish the pain. We all heard this cliche, no pain, no gain. It's a reality. It's a reality. If it's not difficult, if it doesn't touch where you are vulnerable, it doesn't work. It doesn't work any other way. Everything that is hard for you to do, it's your tikkun. I'll give you time. Everything that is hard for you to observe, to go through, it's your tikkun. He's not a bad guy at all. Not a bad guy at all. He's only here to help you. He's only here to give you what you need for you to grow and to cleanse. Every challenge is for two reasons. For you to grow or for you to cleanse. And when you accept it with happiness, when you laugh at it, when you laugh at it, it's not painful anymore. You know, the next time, I, I am so afraid of needle, needle shot. Okay? I'm such a chicken. For the longest time, because I had a horrible, horrible experience when I was five years old. And for the longest time, I consider myself a victim. You know, when we were in Iran, I don't remember if you guys went through it or not. When we were five years old, six years old, we were in school since she was, and they had to do vaccination. Okay? What do they do? They bring all my classmates. We're like hundreds of five-year-old kids. We would stand behind 
the door of the principal, and somebody with a white outfit was in the office of the principal. And I didn't know what's going on. And my last name is Guillaume, so in Farsi, um, at the end of the alphabet, so I'm one of the last one in the line. So I see every little kid goes to this room, <laughs> screams, and comes out crying. <laughs> Imagine, 100 kids. And I wasn't like the first one or the second one. First, for an hour, I didn't know what the heck is going on. Why they take every kid to their, to their room? And what do they do to him? I mean, why he screams? And they come out crying. And, you know, I, I, I'm like, oh my God. Then it was my turn. And you go in, and doctors were nice. You know, if you they, uh, walk into the room, and I was crying already before even getting the shots. <laughs> So for the longest term, for the longest time in my life, before Kabbalah, I thought I was a victim. I thought I was a victim. Was I a victim? Yes. For the longest time in my life, I thought, what a horrible system. What a horrible system. And I hated the doctor, I hated the principal, I hated Iran, I hated everything about it. Then I realized one of the tikkun of the Scorpio is unknown fear. Unknown fear. Fear of pain. It's the tikkun of a Scorpio. Imagine. Imagine my tikkun was overcoming the fear of pain. I mean. I played soccer and I would get hurt, I broke my knee, I broke my hand, but because I choose to play soccer, I wouldn't even cry in front of my mom. My hand was broken, it was two pieces. I went to my mom and I didn't want to cry because she wouldn't let me go play soccer again. So I held on to the pain. Compare that pain with the pain of a little needle. But because I thought it was unfair, because I thought I was a victim, I was so afraid of pain, of the pain of a needle. Mm -hmm. Then, when I study Kabbalah and I study psycho uh, uh, astrology, I learned one of the tikkun of the poor <coughs> emotional Scorpio is a fear of pain. Not the pain itself, fear of pain. Now, God, in his merciful way, created a situation in my childhood to totally have that correction built in me. So years later, I study and I learn, what's the big deal? So now I go to the doctors and I go, I'm the tour, hit it. Who's <laughs> <laughs> scared? I laugh at it. I go give blood for God's sake. And I look at the needle. Not that it's not, still I'm scared, believe me, but I face it now. I face that challenge now. And I don't look at what happened to me as a, as a victim abuse, that I was abused. You know, in Kabbalah we learn whatever happens to you until age of 12 for girls and 13 for boys, it's exactly what needs to happen to you for your correction, for your tikkun. I know in today's society they say, oh, this boy was abused, and it's sad. I understand it. And we have to prevent all these issues. That's beside the point. But the things we go through, it's meant to happen. He's watching it. He's creating it. Because there is a correction to be made. There is a growth to be made. I need to go through something to overcome the fear of pain. Not the pain itself. The fear of pain. So God created that for me. God created my name to be the last in the line, so I totally get it. Not the first one. God doesn't give you free lunch. He gives you a good test, a powerful test. He doesn't let nobody cheat it. He gives it to you. <laughs> A 
everything that a challenge happens to you. Ayah Gadosh, Rabbi Isaac Luria, suggests that at that moment, picture that everything is a met and is everything is perfect. At that moment, at the present time, just imagine, picture it, have a meditation for a second. Everything that is happening, it's happening by order, and it's happening exactly according to what we call a met. You know when somebody, God forbid, died, we say, a met okay. This is a met. This has had to happen. A met is Aleph, Mem and Taf. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Taf is the light. last one, Mem in the middle. Mm -hmm. That means throughout the whole 22 Hebrew letters that creates the whole reality, physical reality, and the spiritual reality, everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. So, but when I react to it, when I'm not comfortable with it, when it's not on my time, when it's not according to what I want, I react, I become emotional. And the moment you become emotional, you lose the opportunity that where is, that, that where is the light in this challenge. It says there is an inner perfection that exists in everything at any moment. At any moment. Not that tomorrow will be okay. This is okay. This is okay. Why the Kabbalist says, bring it on, give me more? Give me more. Oh, I love it. Give me more. What do you mean, give me more? What do you mean, give me more? Someone is in pain, give me more? The moment you say, give me more, you're not a victim anymore. You're more powerful than the challenge. Now you could be the cause of fixing that versus you being the victim or the effect of what is happening. You know, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem doesn't mean, thank you, God. It doesn't mean, thank you, God. Baruch Hashem means, bring it on. Bring it on, God. Give me more. Give me more. <laughs> bring the blessing. Give me more. Baruch Hashem, something bad happened. Baruch Hashem. It means, give me more. Every time that a challenge happens, I'm going to give you a few hints of how to deal with the daily challenges. First of all, remember this. Do not run away from the challenges. Don't postpone it for tomorrow, an hour from now. No, face the challenges. Face the challenges. You don't have to solve the challenges at that time. Because you may not be in the right mindset to fix that challenge at that time. But see it, face it, look at it, don't run away from it, don't be scared of it. Don't be scared of the challenges. Face it, look at it, see what it is. Don't look for an immediate solution. There is no immediate solution. There is no immediate fix. There is a process, a process of acknowledging it, process of Dean, seeing it, process of observing it. Process of observing it. And then be honest with yourself. What do I mean by being honest with yourself? Accept responsibility that what is happening, why this is happening for you. Accept it. Know that it's for you. Accept the responsibility of what happens to you. So you observe it, you accept it, and then have the trust, have the certainty that there is a hidden blessing in this what is happening. Yes. You see, step by step now you're in control. You're changing it. Count your blessing when a challenge comes. Count your blessing when a challenge comes. 
when you're deep into your emotion and you're hurt by that challenge, or you don't know what to do with that challenge, or you don't understand that challenge. It's so concealed, you don't understand it. You want to understand it. You want to understand it. How do you come to peace with it? Count your blessing. Blessing that we have. Blessing that you have. Yeah. You know, they say, if you have clothes to wear, if you have a room to sleep, if you have a bite to eat, you're better than 80% of the population of the world. If you have money in your pocket or in your bank account, it doesn't say how much. It doesn't say how much. If you have money, you're among the top 8% of the population. Count your blessing. See the good. And then shift the way you perceive that difficulty. Change your perception. See the good in it. Inject the certainty, inject the emuna that there is good in here. I don't understand it now because I'm emotional, I'm under stress, I'm under whatever it is. But have the certainty that there is hidden blessing in there. <coughs> and uh, you know, when I say pause, when we say restriction, the concept of restriction in Kabbalah, restriction is what Kabbalists uh, suggest that restriction creates light. Restriction creates light. Pushing back, holding back, not reacting creates light. Rabbi Ver used to have the most simple example of the light bulb. You know, in a light bulb, there is positive pole and a negative pole. One is giver, one is taker, just like what's happening in this world. And if you put these two poles together without any restriction, the light bulb burns. Light bulb burns. For a split second, there is a tremendous amount of light, which we call it instant gratification, but then it burns. But when you inject a resistor, when you inject the restriction between these two poles, when you hold back, when you don't let your emotion take over you, when you don't make everything dramatic, when you don't become a drama queen or drama king. <laughs> Every time you become a drama king or a drama queen, you've lost the opportunity. You burn that <coughs> restriction. It burns you. So restriction means different thing for different tikkunim. Restriction for somebody means work harder. Restriction for someone means don't work too hard. Restriction for someone means to give, be kind. Restriction, restriction for someone means don't be too kind, don't be too giving, don't spoil, don't override. <coughs> so restriction is what you are uncomfortable with. Sorry, I know today tonight lesson is not so soft and easy. And, you know, Kabbalah doesn't uh, rub your back. You know, Kabbalah doesn't say, oh, hey, bimiram. No, we don't have that in Kabbalah. Kabbalah is to empower you, to see that you have the power, the power of restriction for you to create light. The power to say no when you need to say no, or power to say yes when you think you cannot do it. The power to empower you, the energy to empower you, to become the best that you can be. So, to make this simple again, cherish the challenges. No matter what it is, no matter how awful it is, no matter how difficult it is, laugh at it. And just laugh at it. You see somebody you don't like to see, laugh at it. You're not hateful anymore. You know, we all have people who we like, and we all have people who we don't like. Right? And the funny thing is, you run into the people who you don't like so much, they keep coming at you. You go to the supermarket, they show up. 
You go to a movie theater, they sit right by you. You go to a wedding, they assign you on the same table as you. Right? Laugh at it. Cherish it. There is a tikkun. There is a tikkun. So you have to cherish it. Laugh at it. And don't react to it. And when you want to confront yourself, when you want to confront somebody else, as long as you're under emotional, as long as you are <coughs> hurt emotionally, you have to hold on to that restriction until you're no longer emotional. You see the light. You understand it. Sometimes this restriction might take a day, two days. You know, in the Zohar it says, when you want to confront someone and you're angry, wait at least three days. Minimum is three days. Like one of the things we don't do during the Omer is to confront people. Why? Is a negative time? Is Omer a negative time? No. There's too much light. There's too much emotional going on. So when you go and you want to confront with someone, because the energy is so powerful, it's so emotional, even if you stay proactive, the other person might be very reactive. That's why she reacted the way she reacted, you see? <coughs> That's why they said what they said. If you totally understand it, say, good, good for me. There's something there for me to learn. So we cherish it. Cherish the challenges, laugh at it, pause and wait and, until you see the light. And sometimes seeing this light, I take years. I take years. For me, the Suzanne took 40 years. 40 years. For 40 years, I acted like a victim. For 40 years, I criticized Iran, school, teachers and hated my teachers and hated my school not knowing that boy they did such a good job. Now any question? Yeah my question is that so as long as your intention is good yes. based on your tikkun yes. you have to find good and bad and bad and good. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Is that is that good enough? Like, like because, like. As you, long as your intention is good. Yeah. Okay. Then. Then, uh, as long as my intention, my intention is good, based on my tikkun, I can find good and bad, and bad and good. Okay. So that's tree of life, basically. So that's what I'm getting from you, like, because based on your perception, you can come and say. Devarim is this. Let me throw let me throw another curveball okay. at you. There is no such a thing as bad. What I perceived as bad was it bad? No. Giving a test to students is it bad? No. Cleansing someone's naked darkness negativity is it bad? No. Bringing justice to the world is it bad? No. It's difficult, it's hard, but if I change my perception towards what's happening, we understand there is no such a thing as darkness. There is no such a thing as bad. There is no thing like that. There is an illusion of darkness. Illusion of darkness. But it's only illusion. It's only illusion. Why is it illusion? So for you to see the reality, the emit behind the darkness. Rabbi Berg used to say, the moment you turn on the lights, the darkness disappears. What happened to the darkness? What happened to the darkness? You flip a switch and the darkness disappears. Where does it go? It's illusion. It doesn't really exist. There is no such thing as bad. Hard, difficult, yes. Yes. Challenging, yes. Difficult, yes. Painful, yes, but not bad. When you go to gym, you get a trainer. Your comfort zone is to lift 20 pounds of weight. That's comfortable with you. And if you keep lifting 20 pounds weight, it's not going to affect your body that much. You get a trainer, it's harsh and, harsh and hard, and tells you, no, pick up a 50 pounder. 
You lift it up and it's hard, it's painful. Is it bad? No, it's making you stronger. It's not bad. So there is no such thing as bad. Tree of life. God says, I create two reality for you. It's a chayim, tree of life, or tree of good and bad. Don't choose the tree of good and bad. Don't fall into the falls of the illusionary world. Everything is tree of life. Everything is tree of life. So it's up to you. He says, I put in front of you. I put in front of you life and death. Choose life. Now, now that I came to this, I want to share something with you guys because tomorrow night is Lakba Omer. Uh, who doesn't know what tomorrow night is? Lakba Omer. Okay. Lakba Omer. Lak means Lamed Gimel, which is 33. Lamed is 30, Gimel is 3. So Omer, we, it's the period between Passover and Shavuot. And uh, the 30th day of Omer which is starting tomorrow night and the whole Thursday, is the birthday of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is one of the greatest sages of all time. You know, I was in Israel about a month ago, and when I went, and when I went to Meron and I visited Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, I learned that after the Kotel, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai site is the most visited site in Israel. Now, the greatness of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is beyond expression, beyond understanding. But there is something, something that I learned and I shared it on Shabbat and I want to share it again with you. Um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had the power to say no to the angel of death. The angel of death could not overtake Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai could not come close to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He would tell the angel of death to stay outside. There are stories in the Zohar that when there is one instance that one of his students is supposed to die, is supposed to be, supposed to get killed. So when he's coming to visit Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon sees that the angel of death, Malach HaMabed, is with his student. He closed the door on uh, angel of death. Tells him, you cannot come in. You cannot come in. There is a, there is a section that says that Malach the angel of death, went to God and says, uh, I, I cannot, uh, there's nothing I can do to this guy. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, we think death, as for Shalom, is just uh, is dying. No, death is the end to everything that is good. A good relationship, financial situation, as we shall have a good health. Everything that comes to a finish when it's not supposed to come to finish. When rejuvenation of everything stops. When awakening of light force stops, that's death. That's why we feel sad. That's why we feel disappointed. It's because of this energy consciousness that we call angel of death. It's not a physical angel. It's the consciousness. Now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had the power, had the power to resurrect. He had the power to rejuvenate life force. When it says in the Zohar that he says he said no to the angel of death, that means he had the power for life, for rejuvenation, for awakening, for establishing something beautiful. To 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 give life to things, whether it be physical, emotional, whatever it is. So he represents that energy consciousness which is not dead, it's life. Life. Now, we know that when Sadiqim leave the leave this physical world, all their force, all their energy becomes physically manifested in the whole world. So starting tomorrow night, for the whole day of Wednesday night and Thursday, his energy consciousness, which is energy of life, energy of rejuvenation, energy of um, awakening, awakening goodness, awakening love, awakening everything that is not, it's dormant, it's sleeping. That energy exists on Wednesday and Thursday. 
And the more you connect to it, the more you believe in it, the more you receive the energy of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You know, tomorrow night in Meron, almost 500,000 people every year, they go camp around his cave. And they sing, and they, they, they create these fires. Because when Rabbi Shimon was leaving the world, there was a fire around him. And nobody got cut close to him. We don't know how he passed away. There is no, his gravesite is not visible. Because his body is intact in this cave that was covered miraculously. So Rabbi Shimon never died. Rabbi Shimon never died. They say two people knew the value of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Only two people in the world. They knew the value, the power of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. One is Rabbi Akiva, his teacher. And you know who's the second one? God himself. God knows how powerful Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So when you connect, and like Omer, you know, we don't do anything during the Omer, we don't celebrate, there's no wedding, there's no namzad, there's nothing until like Omer, and all of a sudden, Thursday on, boy, all the caterers are going to be super busy, we have namzadis and arusis and bam, 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 because he rejuvenates life again. He rejuvenates continuity again. So my suggestion to you is tomorrow night, definitely, Remember to light up the 24 hours candle for his neshama. Bring it home. Connect to him. If you have Zohar at home, read it, scan it, connect to it. Say Anabir Koach. Ask Rabbi Shimon to come and assist you. Ask Rabbi Shimon to awaken what it needs in you to be awakened. If there is a change in your life that you need to create, ask Rabbi Shimon to assist you. His energy will be here on Wednesday night and all Thursday to assist you. The more you're aware of it, the more you receive it. The more you desire it, the more you receive it. Juna. Any Zohar? Any Zohar. Any Zohar. Any Zohar. Any Zohar. It's better to read the section of this week, which is uh, uh, Bahar, Bahar Sinai. But you could read any section of the Zohar that you like. What's the number of the This one is 16. This one has four different uh, parashot in it. But any Zohar if you have, even if you have the small Zohar. Uh, recite the Anna Bekoach, scan the 72 names, be a spiritual, ask for assistance of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Do you know? There is no special, you just light up the candle for the, like the, you light up the candle, but you inject the meditation that this is for the soul, and the life force of the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Zuchute Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I, uh, so I have a question about uh, forgiving people. See the challenge, for example. People, society, this society cannot take advantage of us if we, for example, Who can her, no, her parking yes. was uh, given to the neighbor. Yes. So if she doesn't say anything, yes. They don't think that is a good person take advantage of her? No, it but depends on her tikkun. It depends on her tikkun. That is good for her. But what about the other person? Now, no. so as long as she goes, as long as she goes, yeah. I'm using no, it. As long as you go upset every time that they park yeah. in front of your house and you get frustrated, you've lost the opportunity. <coughs> you understand? Yeah. Because now, the person that parked the car in front of you and made you uncomfortable is touching where you are vulnerable. Where is your tikkun is? This is good for her. Yes. Now, if she comes to a resolution, you know what? Maybe all these cars that they're... This is a ex stupid example. But maybe all these cars that they park in front of me prohibit of the bad people to come around my house. Nobody's going to come and shoot me because there are too many cars in here. Now I don't have a problem with it anymore. You understand? Now you don't have a problem with it anymore. Now that you don't have a problem with it, now you're not emotional about it, you could go and tell the guy, I don't think it's right for you to park the car. 
Yeah, maybe they prevent the robbery you, or yeah, people exactly. coming to my house. Right. They see a lot of cars and a lot of people. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Asha wanted to create protection for you. You see, Asha wanted to create protection for you. If you look at it like that, do you care now they park in front of you? No. <laughs> you have an employee and yes. she comes or he comes always late yes. or goes early. Yes. And you say, okay, it's a challenge, but they can't let them go, let them go. No. What's going on there? No. Yes. No, no, no. Good, 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 good example. <laughs> if you have a lazy employee, lazy employee, do you have to put up with it to say, oh, this is my tikkun? No. Your tikkun is how to handle it. You could go to your third place and say, you know, I really feel for you. Because you come late all the time, what's your problem in life? What is causing you to be late? Is there something at home that bothers you that causes you not to come? You think you would come late again? <laughs> not to you. <laughs> You see, now you're not frustrated no. by him. If you think about it, now you are compassionate. Now you say, he's, God sent him, this employee, to me to help him change. And how you can help him? By changing yourself, change your perception of being frustrated boss versus a caring boss, a compassionate boss. Let's do another call.